Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, first um, split session at um, Kina at uh, OSSA 2017. Just before we get started, just a reminder to everybody the uh, usual sort of things. Put your mobile phone on silent, and you can ask questions via the mobile app, which hopefully we'll be able to get access to those questions. Um, otherwise, uh, Frank will be taking questions during his presentation, as well as there should be time at the end. Um, for this first session, we've got um, Frank Walsh from uh, Malwarebytes, who will be uh, happy to introduce himself. So please give Frank a uh, round of applause and a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so my name is Frank Walsh. I'm the Vice President of Solution Architecture at Malwarebytes. I am responsible for our global sales engineering team, as well as our integration efforts with other security practice, uh, practi practitioners and uh, solutions in the market space. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Malwarebytes, the brand? Great. That's what I usually expect to see. So uh, I started my career about 15 years ago and uh, put myself through college uh, disinfecting malware at a local computer store. And uh, I recall that one of the first tools that I had access to for malware disinfection was Malwarebytes. And so our brand has been synonymous for a long period of time with the idea of remediation. Uh, we're an alternative to wiping and reloading in every case that uh, a malware infection occurs. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Uh, our agenda is going to be the focus initially on the continued growth of malware that we're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, and then subsequently, we'll talk a little bit about how quickly malware is being distributed and the techniques in which it's being distributed, and, and also a little bit about methods used by malware authors to evade detection. Uh, so, so what we're seeing in the marketplace today is that malware uh, continues to grow and morph. Uh, basically, we're seeing that on a weekly basis, 2,100 different families and variants are being added to our intelligence that's sweeping the, the entire world. Uh, we're recognizing that malware samples are being authored no longer by hacktivists. They are uh, being authored by malicious attackers with specific goals in mind. Uh, how many of you have experienced a malware infection in the last 12 months of any type? Wow, I, th I think that probably a little more honesty here. I think uh, every one of us has in some way experienced a malware attack, and if we aren't aware that we've experienced one, we, uh, we, we may have experienced one without knowing. Uh, last week we had the uh, Eternal Blue attack that was leveraged in order to deploy uh, WannaCry. We are now seeing a variant of ransomware I'll talk about a little uh, that's actually using a fileless approach uh, and, and Eternal Blue for delivery. Uh, specific intent. Right now we're seeing that malicious attackers have a specific intent uh, in, in both targeting consumers and businesses. Uh, and malware is multi-purpose, right? So in addition to having a single goal in mind, uh, almost every malware sample that we're seeing out there uh, has a, a number of purposes in mind. Uh, some of those purposes include ransomware, ad fraud, uh, Android delivery, we're seeing uh, an advent of malware samples that are targeting uh, Android devices. Uh, botnets, uh, we're seeing banking trojans, and I'll talk a little more in just a moment about how we're seeing uh, the prevalence of banking trojans specifically in Australia. Uh, adware, and, and finally, uh, we're, we're seeing some activity in the cryptocurrency miners area, which is leading to degraded system performance and allowing malicious attackers to uh, leverage enterprise and consumer resources to actually mine crypto uh, currencies like Bitcoin. Uh, and finally, uh, the, this, this advent of additional attacks and, and uh, attack surface and, and variants and families of malware uh, is, is basically being fueled in many ways by modifications to uh, malware techniques for deployment. Uh, and also uh, techniques to avoid detection and, uh, and finally to add and remove functionality uh, on demand, right? So uh, if we take that number that I initially said, 2,100 infections occurring on a weekly basis that we're seeing in our threat intelligence, uh, and we take it out to a three-month period, that equates to 26,000 newly modified samples and, uh, and, and, and malware uh, family and variants uh, that, that we're recording on a three-month basis. And finally, on a yearly basis, uh, this equates to approximately 104,000 uh, newly modified uh, malware families and variants uh, in, in the marketplace. Uh, and, and so when we think about that and we think specifically about Australia, Malwarebytes uh, this past year, every year we run what we call the State of Malware Report, uh, which consists of the information we gather from the 100 million windows 
and Android devices in the consumer space running our uh, free version of Malwarebytes. Uh, and, and this is basically any time an individual visits our site and downloads Malwarebytes with the end goal of removing an infection that was not prevented by their traditional um, on-host defenses, right, like AV or any other next-gen provider, uh, we, we find out what, what solutions failed that we're cleaning up after. Uh, and it, this sampling that we did occurred over a, approximately 200 countries, uh, and what we found were approximately a billion detected malware samples. Uh, measuring the impacts of the six categories that you're seeing on the right. Uh, here's what we found out uh, about malware in Australia. So uh, specifically, uh, mal malware, the category of banking trojans was uh, notable in, in uh, Australia. Australia was ranked seventh in global detections in banking trojans. Uh, that's ten times the global average. Uh, we also found that uh, Australia ranked eighth in ad fraud, uh, 18th in Android malware, and another area of notable malware uh, infection in Australia was ransomware. Uh, Australia ranged sixth in global detection of ransomware. And in our survey, survey period of the month of October uh, last year, uh, we saw that 31.4% of all the uh, ransomware, uh, server ransomware detections occurred in Australia. Uh, so we uh, all uh, know uh, very well about the attack that occurred uh, last week with WannaCry. Uh, we would not probably consider that the, the most effective deployment of ransomware, although it, it uh, uh, generated a tremendous amount of attention in the news. Uh, when you look at the effectiveness to extract uh, revenue, the uh, Bitcoin wallet last uh, I checked had around $90,000 uh, in it. Uh, it. When you think about it, uh, a, a targeted attack uh, that's more specifically uh, targeting a specific business uh, can likely achieve that type of return uh, without uh, the type of media attention or uh, national uh, focus by both con uh, intelligence agencies and uh, uh, security providers. So uh, when we think about this and we think about uh, it's looking at how what malware has developed uh, over the last decade, uh, we've seen a continued trend, right, moving from uh, in 2008 approximately 20 million cases of, of malware uh, that, that, and instances of malware that we, we found uh, straight all the way through to in 2017 uh, figures which represent that will exceed what we've seen in 2014, 15, and 16. Well, so the question is how? Uh, we know why. We know that hackers are no longer just hacktivists, right? They've determined a way by which they can uh, create profit uh, out of the installation of malware on endpoints, uh, but, but how? How are malicious attackers able to accomplish uh, the, these types of attacks with this level of efficiency, right? And, and the real answer is that the barrier to becoming a malicious attacker has significantly dropped, right? And I'll describe a couple different ways by which that barrier to entry has dropped both in delivery and uh, detection evasion. Uh, the, first, I want to talk a little bit about a different uh, categories of, of malware de uh, techniques by which malware avoids detection. Uh, the first I would call polymorphic malware, and, and really these are techniques be by which malicious attackers adjust the appearance of malware to avoid detection, right? So uh, pre-execution detection before something runs. Uh, the second category I would re refer to as metamorphic malware. These are changes in behavior, and there are uh, techniques which I would consider simple in uh, modifying the internal logic of malware or adding junk logic around the uh, malicious code in, in malware to uh, basically avoid behavioral detection techniques. Uh, but there are also some advanced techniques that are employed by, uh, you know, sophisticated attacks, APT style attacks, and targeted threat uh, actors in the space. And then finally, we're seeing the advent of what I would refer to as genetic malware. And these are malware samples that are delivered in many cases in two parts. They use a uh, unique uh, fingerprint of the machine that they're attempting to target to basically encrypt the delivered payload. Uh, and if that attempt to, that malware is attempted to be detonated on another uh, machine, it, it won't detonate because the, the fingerprint is necessary to decrypt the, the, the malware. Uh, the, the value that this presents to a malicious attacker is that it makes it very, very difficult to reverse engineer a, a piece of malware that's uh, genetic in, in the way it's protected. Uh, the, the idea is that in protecting malware using a, a, a genetic protection, a uh, malicious attacker can uh, basically uh, target a specific host, avoid detection on that host, and avoid any sort of behavioral analysis that might come through the process of reverse engineering 
or intelligence-based defense layer that is updated uh, using uh, the research performed by a malware research team at any, at any organization or security provider. Uh, so when we think about these pre- and post-execution uh, techniques to avoiding detection, uh, really, and, and then we think about how the barrier to entry has changed, there's a, a number of specific tools which are available uh, now uh, to uh, cyber criminals or want to be cyber criminals, anyone who has an interest in uh, delivering and creating malware. Uh, we refer to them as builders, right? And so in many cases, these simply started out as, um, you know, GUIs sold with malware on the dark net, uh, which provided a malicious attacker or want to be malicious attacker the ability to uh, basically adjust things like uh, the, the, the communication point uh, by w which the malware communicated back with the um, uh, messaging in, in a ransomware attack, the uh, Bitcoin uh, delivery uh, wallet, uh, which, which the uh, ransom can be delivered to. Um, but really, uh, it, it's grown quite a bit. There's now uh, builders out there that support modularized uh, techniques by which malware can be customized to uh, avoid protection from uh, different things like sandboxing, uh, add flexible functionality to malware, right, uh, focused on the, the categories I described before, ransomware, ad fraud, botnets, banking trojans, adware, and currency miners. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, even delay execution, right, to avoid uh, behavioral detection layers. Uh, so there are a couple of great examples of this. Uh, we have uh, ransomware as a service. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what ransomware as a service is? So a couple of you, yeah, so uh, on the dark net now, you can actually uh, just simply purchase access to ransomware and direct it to any, um, uh, you know, uh, cyber currency wallet that you have on the web. Uh, so the, the barrier of entry is simply finding a location where you can actually purchase uh, this ransomware service. Uh, you don't need any infrastructure. Uh, you simply need to be able to pay the malware author. Uh, we've also recognized that uh, malware authors have actually developed almost like a channel partner network inside uh, the, the dark net, which allows them to have a layer of, of obscurity or, um, to, uh, between them and the uh, purchaser of malware. Uh, this actually allows a malicious attacker to, uh, well, a, a malware author to actually terminate access on demand uh, if they, if, uh, you know, question the uh, actual person purchasing it or if they uh, decide that they're actually done uh, with, with their, uh, if they've made an, enough, which we've seen in some cases where malware uh, authors or ransomware authors have actually disabled and just offered up the public key at the conclusion of their, um, their enterprise. Uh, so a couple different families that we uh, are known to use this type of technique, obviously Zeus uh, we saw, which is everybody knows, uh, SpyEye, Citadel, Black Energy Bot, we've seen a number of emerging uh, malware families and, uh, you know, malware authors and crime syndicates that are uh, designing their malware in such a way. Uh, we've actually also seen revenue sharing uh, with malware authors. We've not only seen malware authors who are, for example, selling access to their uh, malware families uh, as, as a single price, but they're also saying, uh, I'll sell it to you at a reduced price, and at that reduced price, I'll provide you 70-30 uh, revenue share. Uh, and any revenue that's generated. So uh, the important point to make here is beyond this, this builder tool being a way that uh, malicious attackers or uh, would-be malicious attackers have a, an approach by which they can uh, perform criminal activity uh, is that, you know, the malicious attack, uh, the, we're, we're dealing now with uh, criminal enterprises, right? We're no longer dealing with uh, hacktivists. We're dealing with folks uh, who not only are capable to build sophisticated tools to breach the enterprise, exfiltrate information, move laterally, perform privilege escalation. We're dealing with folks who actually have developed business models uh, and staffs around the deployment and distribution of these tools. Uh, so Builders is the first tool that I, I think is relevant to how the uh, entry to, barrier to entry has lo uh, lowered. Another really powerful tool which we're seeing uh, is, is Cryptors, right? And Cryptors have a few different goals. The first is to obfuscate compile binaries with custom algorithms. Uh, we also see the addition of what I would consider junk code, right? These are techniques by which uh, a malicious attacker attempts to avoid post-execution behavioral analysis, right? Or uh, techniques by which sandboxing might identify a um, specific sequence of code. Uh, there are a number of techniques that are both simple and as I shared on the, on the past um, 
slide a, a number of advanced techniques that are used to obfuscate. Uh, but what we've seen is that malicious attackers who have the ability to design an, an approach by which they will uh, extract revenue from a, a target uh, are, are now leveraging a, a separate group of, of malicious uh, actors who are actually designing ways by which they can manipulate the internal logic and uh, delivery of malware to protect it from detection both pre and post execution. So a couple other things about uh, cryptors. Cryptors uh, have the ability to hide malware from both antivirus and anti-malware engines, right? Uh, these are sophisticated techniques uh, that, that employ uh, abilities that uh, cover both uh, AV and next-gen solutions. Uh, they are able to quickly modify the same versions of malware numerous times, and it's not just an application which a uh, would-be malicious attacker uses to modify it um, you know, on demand. There are actually uh, techniques by, what, by which malware itself uh, can actually mutate and, and modify itself at each execution. Uh, and then use tools like Eternal Blue uh, to actually deliver a completely mutated uh, version of the malware to another, another host. Uh, and then finally, uh, I mentioned the use of junk code and random input to obfuscate the actual behavioral activities being performed. So uh, when we think of all this, it really, we, we, we relate this to an underground marketplace for, for builders, cryptors, and malware. Uh, we've seen that there are a number of cryptors that are available that are less effective. They're cheap and sometimes even free. Uh, the best cryptors are very expensive uh, and are sold as a service rather than an individual product, and cyber criminals spend more money hiding their malware from detection than they do even trying to distribute it to their victims, or, or in many cases, even author it. Right? So uh, we also see in the delivery a number of uh, techniques that are being employed by malicious attackers to support communication between a remote host and a, a control server. Uh, one, of, one such technique that's been around for quite a while would be uh, domain generation algorithms, right? And these are now being used in combination with the advent of cloud uh, providers like AWS that allow you to change IP and move around the web using public service providers uh, very, very quickly, right? So uh, the idea behind a domain uh, generation algorithm uh, is that a, any technology that you're employing at the perimeter or inside at the network level um, or on the host monitoring communication that's occurring with remote hosts uh, either by FQDN or IP uh, is, is now variable, right? So it becomes even more difficult for us to monitor based on blacklists, uh, you know, or threat intelligence which is gathered. Uh, these, as I mentioned, can evade blacklists and uh, of known malicious URLs, URIs, and IPs. Uh, and they, the, the end goal here is that they allow for longer communication with command and control servers, right? Uh, in combination with delayed activation or techniques by which a malicious attacker can on demand reactivate uh, a piece of malware. We've even seen instances where uh, malware is leveraging services like Google Drive, right, or Google Docs uh, to perform communication uh, for reactivation, right, and in combination with uh, techniques like domain generation algorithms, we're able to see where malicious attackers are able to remain persistent in the environment and, and remain, uh, keep the ability to communicate with infected hosts. Uh, really, this is one of the major uh, changes that's occurred over the last few years, and, and uh, we've seen uh, all different types of fileless malware attacks uh, through exploitation of both the operating system. Uh, we saw last week the Eternal Blue. Uh, the shadow brokers have said that they're going to be releasing a, a new exploit on a monthly basis. Uh, but in addition to uh, you know exploiting operating system capabilities, there's also the ability to exploit almost each and every uh, standard application on a desktop, Office products, Acrobat, um, uh, different uh, media browsers, media players. Uh, these are techniques by which a malicious attacker, uh, through loading a specific piece of content or executing, for example, a piece of JavaScript embedded into a delivered HTML web page, can cause the, an application, a completely valid application, installed with privileged access to machine resources to perform some unintended uh, function, right? And so in many cases, we've seen that not only are these 
uh, tools being used to actually perform malicious behavior, but they're also being used as delivery mechanisms for malicious payloads, right? So in combination with the tools that I mentioned before, uh, cryptors, packers, and builders, uh, this provides a way by which malicious attackers can deliver malicious payloads, uh, or they can simply uh, embed uh, content into, hide content in the registry, which uh, allows and, and persists malware on the endpoint or, or even causes a um, process that, that's expected to perform a uh, specific function to do something malicious. And in many cases, this is a, a big gap for most AV solutions. Uh, and in some cases, I, I think even a, a real gap for next-gen uh, solutions. We see Microsoft having uh, recently depreciated Emmet. Uh, you know, uh, exploit prevention is a, a, a field where we find that a number of security vendors uh, ha haven't had the, the focus that, that's necessary to protect their uh, customers. Uh, so another uh, tech, uh, technique or, well, a family that we've seen that's employing this uh, fileless malware approach uh, would be Kavter. And uh, last year we saw 500,000 infections of Kavter. The initial purpose of uh, Kavter really uh, has been to perform ad fraud operations, but uh, it's important to note that, uh, first of all, anything that's performing ad fraud operations is, has the ability to uh, click something uh, that might be embedded into a web page. Uh, and if a malicious attacker has the ability to control uh, your web browser, they'd also have the ability to deliver additional malware. So uh, in the past 12 months, we've actually seen instances where Kavter was being utilized to disable security software and also, uh, more specifically, to deliver ransomware. So we've uh, also seen that malicious attackers are being more uh, intelligent about how they're targeting hosts, right? So, uh, you know, one, one early stage, if we look at Lockheed Martin's kill chain, um, uh, is, is the ability to identify comp uh, vulnerable hosts, right? And so there are a number of techniques in, in most um, web browsers by which a piece of JavaScript content uh, embedded into a page or even embedded into the header of a GIF uh, can be used by a malicious attacker to identify uh, vulnerable applications or in-place security defense solutions on an endpoint. Uh, this allows a malicious attacker to avoid creating enough noise to uh, alert your security team to uh, a potential event in progress. Uh, and it also allows them to avoid uh, detection by ad network providers or even uh, malware research teams like um, Malwarebytes. So uh, this is a technique that we have a, a unique defense layer at Malwarebytes to support. I can talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But uh, really, the malware, uh, the fingerprint appro techniques approach to what, it, what it's trying to do is uh, malware and exploit code checks the conditions on a specific victim machine. Uh, if conditions are met, an attack performs. If not, uh, the uh, malware uh, will just simply wait for a, a target host that is susceptible. So uh, really what we're seeing is a war of attrition here with uh, malware authors and with uh, malicious crime syndicates. Uh, malicious crime syndicates are, are uh, malware attackers are, are looking for uh, the lowest hanging fruit, really. They're attempting to identify, in many cases, instances where environments are unpatched, right? I think last week we saw a real evidence as to how uh, common having unpatched uh, environments is. Uh, it, so uh, security hygiene is a big role, uh, plays a big role in defending your enterprise, but uh, it's never going to be perfect, right? Um, the whole definition of zero-day uh, exploit is, is that it's something we didn't know about. Uh, and so you should expect that we'll have uh, continued zero-day exploits as well as what I'd like to refer to as living off the land attack approaches. Last, uh, yesterday on our blog, we, we talked about an approach by which SCF files uh, can be used to actually deliver uh, 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 user account and uh, NTLM v2 hash. How many are familiar with what an SCF file is? Anyone? I wasn't either. So <laughs> it's uh, actually a file that if in a folder in a, on a Windows host, uh, will uh, cause uh, some action to be taken when the folder is opened. Uh, we've actually also found a way by which in Google Chrome, uh, the, an SCF file can be delivered to the endpoints downloads folder without any interaction uh, by the end user, uh, simply by visiting a page that generates the SCF file. The SCF file then in contains uh, information referencing an icon. Uh, that icon uh, can be referenced via an SMB path. 
uh, so you can actually reference a remote IP using both a, uh, an a icon file that doesn't actually exist and in the request uh, over SMB, the uh, credentials that are f for the logged in user account will actually be transmitted. So we're seeing a number of techniques that are being employed, not just for the delivery of malware using exploitation, but ask actually using even intended functions of, of applications that are on a, a machine and, and the operating system function. So uh, things that fingerprinting attacks check for, uh, specific operating systems. Uh, browsers that are in use, uh, not just the major, uh, you know, browser uh, vendor, but also uh, specific versions and subversions. Uh, URL referrers, this is how they, in, in many cases, detect if uh, someone is coming uh, from a, uh, a legitimate source or is a malware researcher or a, um, some sort of uh, technique by which an advertising network is pulling their network to, or their ad network to search for malicious attackers. And then finally, for security software, right? Avoiding security software uh, allows them to use the same techniques repeatedly over longer periods of time and also avoid detection in, in uh, the space uh, at, at, at the uh, target. Uh, and then finally, they're also embedding techniques uh, to uh, utilizing techniques to defeat uh, auto analysis, right? So we've seen uh, in our state of malware report, we pointed out that uh, as, as hard as, as it is to believe, uh, spamming, mouse spamming is actually still the number one source of uh, malware that we're, uh, infection that we're seeing in the enterprise. Uh, so it's been around a long time, but actually, actually turned that into a business. So a malware author who has purchased a, a, a tool, maybe a builder or ransomware as a service or, you know, malware as a service, uh, can actually uh, create a relationship with a, a botnet or a mouse spam provider that is actually going to deliver the content uh, to a, a large body of endpoints or users in hope of having them open one of these attachments. So uh, we've seen that it, it actually a number of techniques are being used. Uh, the first being password protection, another being actually embedding malicious code inside Word documents, inside PowerPoint documents, using Visual Basic Script and OLE objects. This is another significant gap we're seeing in a number of security pro providers in the space. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the actual behavior of running applications, their uh, analysis of Visual Basic Script or OLE objects, uh, you know, or activities, for example, being performed by Adobe Acrobat are, are not being considered uh, as, as a, a malicious activity or, or not be considered with the um, stringency that, that we think is necessary. Uh, and then finally, I, I mentioned a little earlier genetic malware. Uh, really, I think this is where we're headed. In a lot of cases, we're headed to a place where malicious attackers specifically target and encrypt based on characteristics of the host they're looking to attack. Uh, and this will significantly raise the bar for malware researchers as well well as any technology which, uh, like sandboxing, which attempts to uh, take a malware sample and, and analyze its activities. Because if, if activated on a host other than the target host, uh, it's, it's an inert object. It's just not going to run. It's not going to do anything. Uh, and then, so, so really, to review, malware is constantly changing uh, multiple times a day. As I mentioned, we're seeing uh, about a million infections last year that we cleaned up from uh, providers across the, the world. Uh, we're also seeing that uh, effective detection is difficult to achieve given these new techniques. Uh, in many cases, any piece of security software that is available to you uh, is also available to malicious attackers. You should assume that any malicious attacker targeting your enterprise or opportunistically uh, trying to breach your enterprise uh, has considered that you have perimeter defenses in place like a firewall, like sandboxing technologies, like IDS, IPS solutions on the enterprise, that you have an AV solution, that you have a next-gen solution, that you're uh, patching to a reasonable degree. So they're considering these things uh, and, and testing their solutions against uh, different techniques that are being used to prevent attacks both pre- and post-execution. Uh, and finally, uh, more malware uh, leads to more problems, right? We're seeing uh, all different types of unique ways by which malicious attackers are taking malware and changing it to accomplish different goals. Uh, the most recent, I think, would be the cryptocurrency mining, right? Using system resources almost the way uh, 10 years ago SETI did uh, in the study of extraterrestrial life. So, uh, and then finally, uh, pro proactive protection is key, right? Um, I think that I'll, I'll sh share a little detail about uh, what Malwarebytes believes about proactive protection and the uh, implementation and employment of these different techniques. 
Um, but uh, basically, it, protection is a balance uh, both at the network level and at the host level, and also is a balance of both uh, uh, protection technologies and hygiene, improve, improving hygiene and remaining focused on uh, true uh, real-time visibility and action taking when it comes to uh, getting a host uh, up to date as far as patching. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, we, we employ here at Malwarebytes an approach by which we attempt to stop the delivery truck as well as the package. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So um, today's endpoint protections, typically uh, we see uh, utilization of what I would call traditional anti-malware. You could call it antivirus. Uh, this is, uh, viruses are almost a thing of the past. Uh, viruses, when I think of viruses, I think of something before malicious attackers really um, could monetize their malicious intent. Uh, now, really, uh, that they can. Uh, traditional AV solutions are also uh, what we call traditional anti-malware solutions. And then we see that next-gen providers are offering this additional layer of pre-execution prevention. And in many cases, uh, we see our providers offering maybe one or two defense layers in the approach of, uh, you know, protecting from uh, the execution of malware. Uh, but what, and, and then finally, this is where malware bytes comes in, right? So we have been known in the space for cleaning up when these solutions fail. Uh, here's how Malwarebytes thinks about endpoint protection, and here's how we encourage you to think about endpoint protection. So if we think about uh, prevention techniques, pre-execution prevention techniques, and we put them into two categories, the first being uh, intelligence-based and the second being uh, really behavioral-based, right? Uh, we believe that, you know, what we, when we look at traditional AV solutions, typically they were intelligence-based, right? They're signature-based or they employed uh, some limited approach to inspecting the uh, payload pre-execution. Uh, we've now seen the advent of anomaly detection capabilities, some of which are behavioral based, others which are using um, pattern recognition or, or pattern matching, uh, which we would refer to as uh, machine learning uh, as a defense layer. Uh, where Malwarebytes kind of changes this, and, and what we do that I think is unique in the spaces is, is a, a number of different uh, pre-execution layers are added as well as a post-execution behavioral monitoring. So, uh, we do believe that there's still value to be had in intelligence-based defense layers. Uh, we think that uh, they, they do provide some limited value, but um, especially when used in conjunction in a depth and defense strategy. So the first layer uh, we employ is a, a layer we refer to as web protection. This is a cu curated list of threat intelligence uh, URIs and IPs we know to be serving bad content. Uh, we're, we're curating this on a zero-hour basis from approximately 100 million endpoints connected to our consumer product, using our consumer product. Uh, underneath that, we have an application hardening uh, layer. This is a technique by which we prevent uh, vulnerable applications from being fingerprinted. I shared a little bit about how our, um, you know, and malicious attackers are fingerprinting to identify vulnerable machines and specifically deliver exploit or uh, samples that will take effect on a machine. Uh, exploit mitigation, we have both an operating system and third-party application in, uh, a technique by which we hook and, and monitor the activities being performed by uh, any application or, or the operating system looking for typical activities indicative of malicious attack. Uh, we have a uh, application behavior defense layer. This is where we monitor the uh, ability to uh, utilize things like OLE objects or visual basic scripts embedded in Word documents for uh, things that uh, should never be done. For example, a PDF document reaching out to a remote host and grabbing uh, content from and, and trying to uh, launch a process. Uh, beneath that, we do have a machine learning defense layer. We think machine learning is a great uh, component of a solid defense strategy, but we do not think it's a single defense layer that uh, you should employ uh, universally. We think it's, a, it's, it's one of many different strategies. And then finally, we have our intelligence uh, an analysis layer, our heuristic defense layer supported by uh, the threat telemetry we update on a zero hour basis. Those are all pre-execution, post-execution, we have a behavioral monitoring layer, and the goal here is to monitor the actual activities before being performed by anything that executes on the host, looking for those uh, indicative of uh, attack. Uh, for example, in the case of ransomware, things like the disabling of VSS, the deletion of restore points, enumeration of files, uh, the, the uh, encryption of files very, very quickly. Uh, and so, so uh, it, when used in combination, uh, these pre-execution and post-execution uh, defense layers provide a solid approach to defending from attack. Uh, you will still have instances where malware, uh, is, for example, with uh, a, a detonation timer, uh, which uh, it doesn't become active until a certain point, 
may infect a machine, but that's where I think Malwarebytes also stands alone in our remediation function, our ability to remove malware from a machine um, once it's uh, actually penetrated the enterprise. So um, that's the way Malwarebytes thinks about malware uh, protection and remediation. Uh, I'm going to take any questions you guys may have. We've got just, just a couple minutes here. Uh, any questions about the techniques that I, I described or, um, you know, the approach to prevention that I'm, I'm showing here? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, just a question on what's your position on AI in the malware space? Yeah, yeah. So I think when I was uh, talking about anomaly detection, uh, that's, that's what I'm referring to. Um, when we think about uh, AI or machine learning, we're thinking about uh, predictive analytics, uh, pattern recognition or pattern matching, uh, techniques by which we take large samples of data and derive inferences um, on, on pieces of malware that we may never have seen. Uh, we, we believe it's a, a, a one solid defense strategy when used in combination with a number of other techniques. Uh, we think right now uh, the idea that AI is a solitary layer of defense uh, is, is short-sighted, quite honestly. We think it's a, it's a good part of a solid strategy, but it, at this point we still believe there's significant value derived from human analysis um, and also behavioral analysis guided by human inspection of malware. Um, you know, as, as long as the logical uh, adjustments that a uh, machine learning layer is making to the way it prevents or detects uh, malware on, on a machine uh, is, is driven by uh, programmatic logic, which is reasonably static, um, there's the opportunity for a malicious attacker to look for ways to exploit that um, and, and be guaranteed some window of time uh, in which that exploitation of, uh, of a vulnerability or, or weakness in that strategy will work. Um, so in, when used in combination w with uh, other behavioral defense layers and also human-guided uh, intelligence, uh, it does provide some, some significant value, uh, but it's important to uh, realize that, you know, uh, we've gone through a number of phases over the past 20 years of AI winters, uh, and we, we, we don't expect right now uh, AI, uh, we don't believe AI is at, as at a point uh, where it's a, a replacement for all of these other defense layers used in, uh, in depth. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I, I mean, we're seeing a number of different delivery methods being employed. Uh, for example, mouse spam, I mean, we have um, uh, drive-by downloads is another. Another uh, technique is exploit kits. Uh, I, I didn't get all that much into exploit kits, but exploit kits are also available right now for purchase on, on the dark net. Uh, these are folks who spend their time looking for ways to and, and looking to discover uh, techniques by which applications and operating systems can be exploited. Uh, I mentioned the folks at um, Shadow Brokers in, intend to release a new exploit on a monthly basis, so um, we should expect that um, Eternal Blue isn't the end, right? Um, we, we have seen, uh, you know, instances where uh, malware is specifically being used as a backdoor. Uh, we, uh, for example, see how um, Eternal Blue has been um, been used in combination with Double Pulsar uh, to actually uh, provide a backdoor for delivery of other malware samples. Uh, I mentioned um, the utilization of, if, if we go back here, let me show you, of uh, Kavter and how Kavter is being used as a delivery mechanism, right? So uh, there's a number of different vertices. Uh, if, if I was to go through them off the top of my head, we have uh, drive-by download, phishing, social engineering, um, we have uh, uh, packaged with pups and pums. Uh, Malwarebytes also believes that pups and pums create additional uh, opportunity. Uh, malvertising, uh, application exploit, uh, we've actually seen, uh, for example, the SCF uh, approach that I just mentioned is a way by which uh, a malicious attacker can live off the land uh, using just embedded features of the operating system. Uh, so, so we're seeing a number of different techniques in place. I think we, we also have recognized that the uh, tried and trusted and, and actually the older techniques like mouse spam are still the most prevalent. Um, if we look at what just happened with Eternal Blue, as I shared earlier, uh, I would not consider that the most effective ransomware attack, uh, given its prevalence and uh, given, I mean, even the embedded backdoor, the attention it drew led to the discovery and, um, you know, and, and activation of that um, uh, kill switch 
in, in, in just a matter of a day, right? If they had been a little more discriminatory in, in how the um, uh, worm moved, uh, they, they may have been able to accomplish far more um, damage, right? So um, I think we're going to see more worms. I think that this was uh, the tip of the iceberg. I think it's going to reignite interest in worms. I think we're going to see more sophisticated worms over the next 24 months. I think we'll see people who are um, creating worms that don't just spread um, indefinitely uh, with, without some type of control. And uh, I'd expect to see um, far if fewer, if, if any, kill switches, um, like we saw in, uh, in the uh, WannaCry attack. Um, so I, I think that we're, we're seeing also an, another emerging uh, space What we talk about in our state of malware part uh, would be IoT devices, right? So these are devices um, that are, every, everything's an IoT device. Your, your car uh, could be in some ways considered an IoT device. Uh, and, uh, your, your television, your, um, your uh, refrigerator, I was just looking at a refrigerator with a, a, a computer built into it. Um, so the, the interesting thing here is that these are not uh, solutions that are easy to back up or easy to monitor the uh, behavior of. Right, and, and, so, and these are also uh, hiding places for malicious attackers, right? They may compromise the enterprise using uh, a, a Windows host, but then move and hide on, to, on an IoT device. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, so we see value in sandboxing. I, I mean, Malwarebytes, for example, last year acquired a sandboxing technology. We think there's a value in um, automated behavioral analysis that m can support uh, improvements in both the behavioral prevention and the intelligence defense layers. Uh, you know, we also see value in it to, uh, to the end user, right, or to, to a, a, a business. Um, you know, what I'm describing here are primarily host-based defense uh, techniques and solutions. Uh, there's still a lot of value in having a strong perimeter and having uh, a strong set of tools for analysis of anomalous activity, having a tool set to support proactive patching uh, and, and to adjust your system configurations in real time. Um, so, so I think there's value in it. Um, certainly, uh, we're, we're actually even looking at ways that it could play a role in host-based defense solutions in the future. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Osset, I'd like to thank uh, Frank for his interesting presentation on the current state of malware. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You should be able to get it in the plane. All right, great. <laughs> that was quite interesting. I actually had a question, but there's so many. Yeah, I was sure. I was just curious as to. Um